Hello and welcome to Out and About. My name is Vanessa Victor and this week we're speaking to Ali Zoeb from AZH Photography. And of course, you know, after that, we're going to check out the entertainment highlights. Stick around. We'll be right back. Hello and welcome back. As I said before, today we're speaking to Ali from AZH Photography and we're going to talk about all of everything, everything about photography, fashion here in Tanzania and we're going to pick his brain essentially about what he thinks. Welcome Ali. Thank you very much. So first off, photography, why that as a career choice? Uh, okay, it's a very funny story but um, it was not really a career, career choice for me. But uh, it just developed out of passion. Um, when I was uh, when I was studying in states, um, I used to uh, I was studying chemical engineering, and that used to be really you know a, a big stress for me. And uh, there was I needed something to you know release the stress, so I used to just you know take my camera and go out there and shoot basically. So that's where it developed from. Well, first a lot of people. The stress reliever would not be photography. The stress reliever would be going out with friends, having a few drinks, or something else. So, what was it about photography that made you feel so comfortable that it turned into a stress reliever for you? Well, um, uh, the thing is, like, um, I, I vision life uh, slightly differently, and um, I like to attribute uh, what basically what my vision is that. Whenever I'm, uh, whenever I'm looking at something, there has to, there has to be a beauty behind it um, to draw my vision over there. And um, you know, um, when I, when I, when I held my camera, I, I was able to have control over my vision basically. So when I, when I see something very interesting or something, uh, you know, I would just take my camera and you know, I would maybe spend half an hour, one hour, whatever it takes um, to get that vision that I have. You know, so that's where it, it all started from. And uh, just, you know, to get the engineering head, um, you know, the equations and stuff out of my head. Um, when I used to hold the camera, it just made me forget about everything, you know. So, you know, that's, that's where it started, you know. Um, initially, like, I started doing stuff like uh, photographing people and stuff. That's what I enjoy the most. Um, and, you know, I, and when I was looking at my pictures, you know, I, I started developing the interest into it that, you know, um, there is a there is a beauty in everything that you see. Like there is nothing in this world uh, which doesn't have beauty. You know, it's, it just takes the right vision to do it. When you came back to Tanzania, what was the process like from being just out of school, getting started? What was it like? Um, it was uh, it was tough. It was tough not to do photography, but the the social pressure that I I went through because. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, I had a very prestigious degree, and you know, I, by all means, I had the, the ability to stay in America and perform very well there, you know, with my degree. But uh, when I came here for my holidays, um, you know, um, I just got very busy with uh, capturing stuff that I didn't see it when, when I was here, you know, when I was born and raised up here. So it was not really easy for me. The reason is um, there was a lot of uh, pressure from the society. Uh, because um, photography was never considered as a very serious thing and uh, I still think that it's, it's still applicable over here because that this industry has a very big potential to grow um, and uh, you know when I came in uh, you know I thought um, you know that there is potential here you know um, this is something that I enjoy doing um, so you know I, I started doing it but not it was really not necessarily very easy for me initially uh, just because of you know this uh, the social drama I would say uh, which which took place basically yes as a photographer as photography is also art and artists are notoriously known for being very what word would I use picky about certain things so what would be your pet peeves I wouldn't call it rates because there is not really a rate for photography but um, the standard of, I'm not just talking about photography, but I feel like this country lacks the standard of professionalism, you know, the, the standard of uh, valuing professionals was very low. Um, and I decided that there is no way I'm gonna compromise, you know, I'm gonna charge what I feel is right. Um, so I never really compromise on my price. I remember when I initially came here, my pricing was way above what other photographers used to charge at the time. 
but uh, it was difficult to get jobs uh, you know whatever it is but you know I stuck to my pricing because I you know I, I was believing in myself at that time my pricing was not really anything crazy uh, but still people still still found it very very expensive you know um, so that's I mean uh, that's my take on it you know that uh, it was tough uh, but uh, what what really annoys me is people who want to they want to abuse um, uh, your rights uh, mm. of, of uh, you know of performing. They want good work, but they don't want. They don't to want to pay the price. The price for. So the, the standard, you know, that respect for photography was never there. That's what I felt. Um, but now, touch with people are starting to understand that it's not really just going out and shooting, mm. but there is a thought process involved. There is planning involved. There is post production. You know, everything is uh, time consuming. So it's not really as easy as you think it is. You know. Speaking of, um, you you have a standardized set price for what you do in terms of depending on the specific categories that you offer. Well, um, I'll give you an example. Um, a photographer like Osses now, um, he's very vocal about having a non-standardized payment plan depending on the person, on what you want, and negotiation for him is key. Do you? follow along the same lines or do you have a standard set rate for a sad standard set service? So it, it all depends on the kind of assignment. Um, basically, you, like I said, you cannot really have a standardized pricing, but for events and stuff, uh, I don't have a standardized pricing, but what I have is, is a platform for the clients to know where, what, uh, what, they're, what ballpark they're looking at. You know, so that's, that's how I would define it. You know, you cannot uh, you can you can say that you know um, for example if you're shooting a wedding you can say that it's a three-hour ceremony but there might be shots that need to be taken before the event you know uh, you know the time of setting up all these things um, time is money you know so you have to consider all these things you know so it's good to have everything uh, everything planned properly you know I need to know look at the logistics you know I need to look at what uh, what do you want you know I also need to consider how much uh, pros uh, processing I need, you know. So that all uh, defines a pricing scheme, basically. It factors into everything. Yes. For our viewers who don't really maybe understand because they're paying you for a certain service, why are you so focused on the timing? Could you explain why timing for a photographer is such an important thing? When they decide or I decide that, you know, we're going to meet at 10 o'clock and then you show up at 10.30, I've lost 30 minutes of my time. Who's going to pay for that? You know, so I'm, I, I, I don't compromise on timing, you know, I've kicked out many people, including celebrities from my studio, for not being there on time. For, for me, time is everything and everybody knows me, you know, about, uh, knows uh, this about me, that you know, I'm very, very particular about timing. When, when I do shoots and stuff, I, I plan, I, I understand there is traffic, you know, I understand, there, you know, stuff happens, you know. But, um, you know, I mean, we have to get used to it, you, you can't be using this to an advantage now. You know, you, you understand that, you know, it's going to take you an hour to cross the Lender Bridge and leave two hours before, you know, it's not that hard. It's going to save my time, it's going to save your time, um, and, you know, that, that's how it works. So, for some of the, you know, the, the people that I've lost, um, you know, as customers, is it's because of timing, and I don't really feel, uh, I, didn't, I don't feel bad about it, you know, because if they cannot respect time, I don't think they can uh, respect anything else, you know, in life. Since you started, in Dar es Salaam, in Tanzania, to now, 2015. What's been the biggest difference? The biggest difference is um, when I came here about five or six years back, um, there was a monopoly. And there was a monopoly not because um, there are few people here, you know, but it was non-existent, you know, pretty much non-existent here. There were just a, a very few performers here. The market was very big. Um, and you see th uh, those kind of things. So what has changed right now is people are starting to, um, just not photography, but you consider video, artists, um, painters. You see there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of development right now that I see, you know, that people are understanding that this is professional work. Uh, you gotta be paid for it. You gotta pay your bills with it, you know. So that's what I'm, it has not changed. But it is starting to change and I'm very happy to see, you know, there are a lot of photographers out there who are performing very well. You know, some, some people are trying really hard. Um, 
So it's it's all driven by passion at the end of the day. You know what the the difference you, you can the immediate difference that you can see between the performers and the non-performers is you know um, it's just passion. You know. It's interesting to hear you say that because in the entertainment industry, something that's always put out there a lot is this artist, be it in music, in in painters, photography doesn't really want to see that other person succeed because if they succeed they're going to take their jobs but you are all for that why why is um, because i i think competition is good mm -hmm. competition ups your game it helps with development but not a lot of people think like that why do you think that is no there is two ways you can define competition you know you can define competition as competition and you can define competition as healthy competition exactly. you know and um, uh, when you ask me personally, you know, and it's not to sound cocky or whatever, you know, but there is no competition for me. Not because I'm the best or whatever it is, you know, I don't consider myself as the best. Uh, I don't look at myself as to be superior, but there is no competition because there's so much potential in this market. You know, everyone can get a, get a piece of it and not we're not going to be fighting uh, uh, over, over anything. What? If we talk about Ose, we talk about Elbert, we talk about Raki, we talk about Henry, these, you know, the, the, the best photographers in the industry. We are very good friends. You know, there is absolutely no grudge behind us, you know, between us, you know. There is no drama. I mean, you know, everyone is doing good. Everyone is specialized in their own thing. And, uh, you know, we appreciate each other's work, you know. The difference is, um, you know, how much you show it, you know. I mean, publicly, I'm on TV right now. Um, you know, I can tell you that, you know, I'm very, very impressed. And I'm, you know, it really encourages me that um, you know, there, there is people out there who are taking art very seriously, you know. Um, for example, Rocky, um, you know, he, he's been this, uh, in this industry for a, for a very, very long time. He's still doing good, you know, he's still busy. There's nothing wrong, you know, there, there's me, I came into the market, Ose came, Albert came, you know, is it really affecting any of us? Not really, not really, you know, we are all doing, we are all busy doing different things, you know. Um, everyone is specialized in their own different field, you know. So, you know, honestly, if you're asking me about competition, there's absolutely no competition. You know, Tanzania, we have so much potential that, you know, I, I don't even see competition in the next 20 years. I don't see anyone trying to hijack any jobs from me, you know. Um, but then again, when you talk about unhealthy competition is, you know, uh, there is a difference, again, between inspiration and, and being a target, you know. Um, to be inspired, you know, um, I, I, you know, I'm inspired by Osa, I'm inspired by Raki, you know, I'm in, inspired by Henry. There's nothing wrong with it, you know. But the moment um, I start thinking as to how am I going to, you know, how am I going to bring this guy down or, you know, how am I going to hijack the jobs? I mean, you know, it's very, very stupid, you know, honestly. And I see, I see those kind of drama starting to emerge right now, you know. I, I really see uh, those kind of people, um, you know, uh, we have also been targets of. But then, you know, between me and my team, uh, we just take it very easy, you know, because at the end of the day, it's all about your faith. You know, if you are doing things with a very good intention, there is nobody who can stop you. You know, nothing can go wrong. You, you, he might be going out there and, you know, trying to get your clients or, you know, try and uh, backbite about us, you know, in, in, in any way, try to damage us, you know. But uh, at the same time, you have a relation with 100 other good people. So, you know, there is, I, I don't see any sort of shortage, you know, honestly, uh, there is no competition. I, I'll say it again, you know, there's literally no competition. There's plenty of jobs to go around. There's too much going on. You know, there is there is too much and, and unfortunately we don't have the enough manpower. I, you know, I honestly, at this stage, I, I just want more photographers to come in and uh, capture. I mean, um, there are people who ask me that, you know, why don't you go and travel and, you know, um, capture images in other places. I could have been doing photography in America and I, I could have been, you know, I would, I would have been very happy about it. But what is, uh, what is there in Tanzania that is not there in any other foreign country? I mean, we're, we're full of, we're, uh, I'm a fashion photographer, so I'll say we have a lot of beautiful women here. Um, you know, um, uh, talking about uh, the landscape, the nature and everything. We have plenty. I don't even think in my whole lifetime I'm going to be able to capture Tanzania as a whole thing, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, again, talking about people, you know, I, I really enjoy photographing tribes, you know, so I'm very close to the Maasai people and stuff. 
I mean, uh, you know, uh, I just can't go out in Arusha and shoot Maasai people because Maasai are different Maasai are in Tanga and all different parts of Tanzania. So there is a lot of scope, you know, it's, it's just crazy amount of scope. Especially now that there's been so much cultural diffusion, like the Maasai in Zanzibar, the in Da, the in, they're everywhere. It's like Chaga, I'm Chaga, we're everywhere, yeah. <laughs> literally everywhere. So it's hard to put a target and be like, okay, I'm going to Arusha specifically to Exactly. Unless it's like a specific area, like you're going to Serengeti or you're going to a national park, that makes sense. But you can't go to one specific place looking for one specific type of person because that doesn't really exist now. Yeah. It doesn't make sense to have that kind of mentality now. No, there is unlimited resource over here in Tanz. You see somebody, designer, name will be withheld, put out a collection in Dar es Salaam. Say. Four months later, put up the same collection in Lusaka or in Zanzibar. And for me, that's a big no no because where's the creativity in that? If you're going to be putting out one collection, one design of 20, 30 pieces in one space of time, then do that. Mm. I'll, I'll give a big heads up to um, uh, Doreen Mashika. Um, were you there at the show? Yes. Yes. And um, when you go into something like that, um, you see the models are performing very well. The standard of the clothing is very high. People who make the clothing are women, local women. She doesn't have to take her stuff to America to get it made. You know, when we have resource here. So when you see this kind of people performing, you don't have to, you know, think even twice that, you know, are they paying money to be in this industry or what are they doing to be in the industry? But it's all faith. They are working with a very clean intention. They are uplifting people. And you know, when you do those kind of things, you will definitely see a change in yourself. And, and I mean, during Mashika in the past two, three years, I don't think she's growing fast, but I think she's growing exponential. Yes. You know, she's hitting eBay, you know, she's hitting all these the crazy markets out there, you know? It's because it's clean coming from her heart, you know? She's very authentic. She uses local materials. There's everything is authentic about it, you know? It's yeah. not copy-paste. Yes. AZH photography, weekly concepts, three years, five years, 10 years. Where do you see it? One thing that, you know, I really pray that never changes, that one constant factor that, you know, I really pray that, you know, it never changes, is the brotherhood I share uh, with my team. That's, you know, the love and everything, I, I, you know, even if it's 30, 40 years, whether we're doing photography or not, I want it to be, you know, the same constant factor, you know, because we have not compromised on passion. You know, I cannot say that I had less passion five years back or I'm going to have more passion 10 years from now. Uh, what I'm operating right now is the maximum threshold for passion, you know, um, for all of us. Um, so, I mean, that's... That's something that, you know, is, is very close to me that, you know, even after 10 or 15 years, I see ourselves very passionate, whether we're doing photography or anything related to it. Photography is always going to be there in my life and I don't see it coming out anytime soon. I'm really enjoying this and I feel like I'm learning a lot. But uh, what I see, like, in the next 10 or 15 years is still passion, you know. You, you, we're going to be talking here, we might be, uh, you might be having a walking stick, me too, you know. You might be holding this camera, you might be having this conversation again, but I think uh, my passion is never going to die down for this industry. Thank you so much, Ali. It's been a very insightful conversation. I've learned quite a bit, not only about the industry, but about yourself and your character as a person. And I look forward to seeing you two years down the line, three years down the line, but I'm, I'm sure I'm going to see you much sooner than that. No problem. With all these crazy events that are popping up in Dar es Salaam. And that's it for us with this amazing interview. Let's go check out the entertainment highlights and then we'll be right back. Tanzanian model Flaviana Matata is the cover girl for the new African Women magazine's new issue. The first cover shows Flaviana in a green sheer dress by Versailles Boutique with a gorgeous statement neck piece by Tubal Paris. The second shows Flaviana elegant in a gold dress by Sophie Zinga, accessorized with a red raffia shawl 
and another gorgeous statement piece by Tubab Paris. With more of her images inside the magazine, Flaviana Matata looks stunning. Let's take a look at 10 of the most unusual schools in the world. Unusual schools in the world. The boat schools of Bangladesh. The thought of attending school on a boat might seem like a fun, quirky teaching gimmick, but it is a product of necessity in flood-affected Bangladesh. Twice a year, flooding leaves millions of Bangladesh citizens with little to no access to clean water, leading to the development of boat schools by a local non-profit organization intent on making education widely accessible. The non-profit organization, called Shaidale Shwarnavar Shangsta, has now established nearly 100 boat schools, each equipped with solar power, internet access, and even a library. The boat idea has also been put towards houses and healthcare centers. The Witch School of Salem. Leave it to the home of Salem Witch Trials to dedicate an entire school to sorcery. Though most of its 40,000 students opt to study their witchcraft through online learning, the Witch School does offer a physical campus that includes classes like Wicca, Paganism, and Divinatory Arts. Initially based in Roseville, Chicago, the school was moved after coming under fire from local Christians who sprinkled holy water on the vehicles of witching students. It now resides in Salem, home of an active witch community and the site of approximately 200 witchcraft trials between 1692 and 1693. Dong Dong Cave School, China Although it may seem strange and a little creepy to have children attend a school inside a dark cave, villagers in Dong Zhang were simply using the limited resources at their disposal in the development of what is now known as the Cave School. Situated in one of China's poorest areas, the Cave School was established out of necessity for a village that couldn't otherwise afford to build a standalone school. This wasn't deemed to be an ideal learning environment, and so the Chinese government stepped in and closed the school in 2001 arguing that the country is not a society of cavemen. River Plate School, Argentina Distractions can manifest themselves in any classroom setting, but students at the River Plate School in Buenos Aires have the added challenge of trying to focus within a world-class soccer stadium. River Plate students spend their school days inside Buenos Aires Stadium, the home of Club Atletico River Plate soccer players that also doubles as an academic institution for its 2,000 pupils. From time to time, the Club Atletico soccer players have been known to hold practices even as school is in session, making for a unique but challenging teaching environment. School of the Future, Philadelphia. It's tough to keep ahead of the curve when it comes to the fast-paced world of digital technology, but that's exactly where students at the Microsoft Design School of the Future in Philadelphia find themselves. Since opening in 2006, the ambitious $63 million project has welcomed students, most of whom come from low-income households and all selected through a lottery process, to a paperless environment with a laptop given to each pupil. The technologically advanced school has drawn global attention, with visitors coming in from more than 50 countries. Burgess Hill School, England The 1960s were a culturally complex decade filled with youthful activism and a rebellious spirit, and the Burgess Hill School in the London suburb of Hampstead reflected that. Rules didn't apply at Burgess where the school's progressive mandate meant that students could smoke, listen to music, wear sunglasses, and even bring pets to class. Even the lessons themselves were voluntary, at this boarding school that doubled as a social experiment. The lack of structure might have worked for some, but it's no wonder that the school has long since shut its doors. Gulu Elementary School, China. Students must brave the Luoma Way, filled with sharp turns narrow rocky passages and rickety bridges each day in order to get to the Gulu School, tucked away in the mountains of China's Sichuan province. That the school even exists is a testament to the work of Shen Qijun, the school's only teacher who single-handedly rallied villagers to band together and renovate Gulu in the late 80s. Since then, the school has added plumbing and even a basketball net, although you probably don't want to miss your shot. It's a long way down the mountain. Harvey Milk High School, New York. Named after the charismatic California politician who helped forward the gay rights movement in the 1970s, this New York school was built to cater to the needs of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender students who may feel marginalized elsewhere. Students of any sexual orientation are welcome to enroll, but the school was born out of the needs of students who didn't feel like they fit in at any other institution. Harvey Milk High has come under plenty of fire during its existence from anti-gay groups but continues to thrive to this day. The Train Platform Schools of India 
Thanks to Indian teacher Inderjeet Kurana, impoverished children in certain parts of India who don't have access to education can have the education brought to them. After encountering children begging for money instead of attending school on her train ride to work, Kurana led an effort to introduce train schools, where children can learn how to read and write by gathering between train stops. The program, which started with just one school, now brings education to over 4,000 students. The program also provides food and medication to the families of the students. Forest kindergartens across Europe. Outdoor time comes long before the recess bell for young children who attend forest schools. Popularized in Europe, forest kindergartens enable children aged 3 to 6 to interact with their natural surroundings through outdoor classrooms. They can climb trees, stroll in the grass and find creative ways to engage with nature and learn firsthand about their natural surroundings. But they better be dressed appropriately. Most of these schools operate rain or shine and regardless of the season. watch film this week in the movie Ted 2 the sequel to the summer 2012 box office smash Ted Ted gets married to Tammy Lynn Mark Wahlberg returns as John Bennett and Seth MacFarlane is the voice of Ted again walking teddy bear is about to marry his girlfriend I now pronounce you teddy bear and wife Let me kiss the bear proving that Americans don't rap about anything so I got some big news. Tammy Lynn and I are gonna have a baby. That's awesome! Wait, how do you guys... We, uh, we need a sperm donut. What is that? What, what are you doing? I'm getting ready, dude. What do you mean you're getting ready? What are you, you, what are you doing with your hand? What do you think you are, a red lobster? Hey, Johnny, you did it! Right here, buddy. Catch! What the... Dude, that's somebody's kid! Fight the shit! Oh, dude, it's in my eyes! I'm blinking it in! Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm gonna take a picture and post it on Facebook. What?! Hashtag Grr Monday. No! Oh my God, Teddy, look at this. It says if we want to have a baby, you're going to have to prove you're a person in a court of law. This is a nightmare. We got to fight it. We'll get a lawyer and we'll sue the government for your civil rights. The power. I'm Samantha Jackson. It must be Ted. Uh, yeah, Samantha Jackson. What's your middle name? Leslie. Oh my God, you're Sam L. Jackson. That's great to me, just like Sam L. Jackson. Who is that? You ever seen any movie ever? He's the black guy. The power. They've denied you the same rights as everybody else just because you're different. Can you get me my life back? Ted, do you believe you have a soul? <clears throat> what did you think I would do at this moment? Objection. Overruled. You, you want to be human in the eyes of the law. The important thing about being human is making a contribution to society. Oh. Where the hell's my coffee? You're not building rockets. Figure it out. Let's do it. I'm gonna do it. Oh, oh my God. Who did that? Oh. Sir, I apologize for my five-year-old child. Bad butch. You sit there and eat your fish nuggets. Fish nuggets. Go, go, go. Ask you a few test questions now. You ready? Yep, bring it on. Do you consider yourself to be human? Objection. Sustained. No, the witness can't object. Overruled. Sidebar. Guilty. Speculation. Hearsay. Bailiff. Briefcase. Disregard. In my chamber. Stop beaver on the witness. Arrest. We could totally be lawyers. Thanks. And that's it for this week's episode. If you have any comments, suggestions, or criticisms, check us out on our Facebook and Twitter pages. And of course, you know. At some point, you can also watch the show on YouTube. Until then, my name is Vanessa Victor. This is Out and About, Capital TV, your channel of choice.